Hello and welcome. My name is Joshua White, director of A Thinking Generation Ministries, and welcome to Some TV. It's a pleasure to be here. Our topic today, Daniel, chapter zero, lessons on true education from the story of Daniel. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege to study your word. Thank you for this precious counsel, these amazing stories that you've given us. And Lord, as we seek to study and better understand the story of Daniel and the lessons that it has for us, I pray that you'll grant us your spirit, that you will open our hearts and minds to better understand your truth. Please speak through me. May this message be from you and not my own. And I ask in Jesus' name, amen. How many of you believe that there's a crisis coming? I'm sure every one of us believes that. There is a crisis coming, and it is very near. But how many of you believe that we must prepare for the crisis? How many of you believe that we must be preparing our children for the crisis? This is of utmost importance. This is part of our message on true education. So for that, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Daniel and chapter 0. (laughs) Well, of course, we don't have the Daniel chapter zero, right? Or do we? We focus often on Daniel's success story. We know the story of Daniel chapter one and two and three and all those amazing evidences, this, this, this man of God who stood for his faith at any cost. But how many times do we focus on what prepared Daniel for success? This is an important study because if we want to be prepared for the crisis that is coming, we had best understand what prepared Daniel for the crisis that came in his life. So what enabled success? How did Daniel and his three friends stand alone when the remainder did not? You know, Daniel and his three friends are representatives of Earth's final generation, that last day's remnant people, that remnant who will stand firm for the truth, though the heavens fall. Let me give you a few examples in ways that Daniel and his friends represent God's last day's remnant people. First of all, they are a remnant. (laughs) They were a remnant of the remnant taken out of of the nation of Israel and those captives. And so uh, right there is a representation as God's last day's people are also a remnant. Daniel and his friends lived in a prophetic time period during that 70-year prophecy. In fact, the whole captivity of Babylon Babylon was predicted. Do God's last days people live in a prophetic time period? Absolutely they do. Daniel and his friends were tested on the matter of worship. Are God's last days people brought to test on the matter of worship? Absolutely. Daniel and his friends were tested on the matter of their diet. Have God's last days people been given a special message on health? Absolutely, there are many similarities, many parallels with the character of Daniel and his friends and the character of God's last days people. But there is yet another. Daniel specifically is a representative of the 144,000 for two reasons. First of all, we know that Cyrus is, Cyrus is a type of Christ. Now, Daniel lived through a time of captivity when physical Babylon ruled the world up until the time of Cyrus, who was a representative of Jesus. Just as that 144,000, which I hope we're striving to be, lives through a time of crisis, when it, through a time when spiritual Babylon rules the world up until the coming of Jesus, whom Cyrus represented. And yet there's another characteristic. Daniel is a representative of the 144,000 in that what was the problem that Daniel's enemies had in the matter of the famous story of Daniel in the lion's den? What was the problem that his enemies encountered? They could find no fault, the Bible says. No fault. And what does the Bible tell us in Revelation about the character of the 144,000, that last day's remnant people, no guile, no guile. So, what gave Daniel and his friends success? In one word, 
It was their education. And just as Daniel's education prepared him for the test, so will, so will our education. And the education that our children receive prepare them for the test. So do we have a Daniel chapter zero? <laughs> we do. We find it in 2 Kings chapter 22, 2 Chronicles 34, and some other areas. We're going to study that. But first, to best understand God's plan of education that was given to the nation of Israel that Daniel's parents followed, we need to go back to the original given at the beginning. We need to study some history. Are you ready for a quick history lesson? Let's go to the book Education, page 20. Education, page 20. We read the system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model for man throughout all after time. Okay, a model for man when? Through all after time. Does this apply to us now? Absolutely. So we can study this model and implement those things that were started then and implement them today. Now, any good educational or program has some important components. First of all, you need a classroom or a place to study. Maybe not actually four walls, but you need a place to study. Did we find that in the Garden of Eden? We need a textbook, we need teachers, we need students, and we need a learning objective. Did we find that in the Garden of Eden? Let's continue reading. Education page 20, continuing in this paragraph. The Garden of Eden was the schoolroom. Did we have a classroom in the Garden of Eden? Absolutely. The garden itself. Nature was the lesson book. Did we have a textbook? Absolutely. Nature. Who was the instructor? The Creator Himself was the instructor, and the parents of the human family were the students. Now, there's a lot we can unpack from this. But there are a couple of very important points for our study this morning. It says the instructor was God Himself. If the instructor was God Himself, what was the content of the instruction? If you are listening to God speaking to you, what are you hearing? The words of God, right? So we find in the Garden of Eden, they were listening directly to the words of God. Yes, the Bible itself was not in its written form yet, but the content of their plan of education, the content of the original plan of education given by God in the Garden of Eden was based in His words, spoken directly. And we also read that nature was the lesson book. So (laughs) the content of true education as given in the Garden of Eden was the Word of God and the works of God. The Word and the works of God. Now, in this perfect system given in Eden, what was the unit of organization? We find that to be the family. We jump to education page 33. The system of education established in Eden centered in the family. Adam was the son of God, and it was from their father that the children of the highest received instruction. Theirs, in the truest sense, was a family school. Okay, so true education, as we find in this original plan given in the Garden of Eden, I know we're, we're, we're going to get to Daniel, but we find the, the original plan as the content was the words and the works of God, the unit of organization was the family, and the teacher was God himself. But then something ugly called sin came along. What changed? Continuing in education, page 33. In the divine plan of education as adapted to man's condition after the fall. Are we after or before the fall? (laughs) Obviously, we're after the fall, right? So, God took the original plan of education that was so perfect, sin into the world, messed things up, and He adapted it to our condition now, after the fall. What changed? Let's read. Christ stands as the representative of the Father, the connecting link between God and man, He is the great teacher of mankind, and he ordained that men and women should be his representatives. The family was the school, and the parents were the teachers. Okay. Did God throw out the garden as a classroom? No, some things changed, but he didn't get rid of it. Did God throw out his word and his works as the subjects of study when sin entered the world? No, clearly not. Did God throw out the system of the family, the unit of the family, when sin entered the world? No, clearly that did not change. The objective of understanding who God is and connecting with Him, did that change after sin entered the world? No, it became more difficult, but it didn't change. So, what changed when sin entered the world? What changed was the teacher. No longer could God directly communicate with 
His human family. Now it says Jesus is representative of the Father. He's the connecting, connecting link between God and man, and men and women should be his representatives. The family is the school and the parents were the teachers. So after sin entered the world, we find a new level and solemnity in the work of the parent. They are now representing the character of God to their children. It is now, instead of God directly to every human being, we have God through Jesus to the parents and then, G and then the parents representing Jesus to the children. So after the fall, the content was still the words and the works of God. The unit of organization was still the family and the teachers, now it was Jesus through the parents. But we want to get to the story of Daniel. We've established the base, though. The true education according to God's plan is the words and the works of God in the context of the family and imparted by God through Jesus to the parents, to the children. Let's keep moving in history. We find education page 33 again. The education centering in the family was that which prevailed in the days of the patriarchs. All right, we've now moved to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those days of the early patriarchs. For the schools thus established, interesting, it calls them schools, right? God provided the conditions most favorable for the development of character. What was the environment most favorable for the development of character? It was an education centering in the family. Has that changed today? No, it hasn't. The people who were under his direction still pursued the plan of life he had appointed at the beginning. Those who departed from God built for themselves cities, but the men who held fast God's principles of life dwelt among the fields and hills. God's beautiful plan of education still being followed. There were, they were tillers of the soil and keepers of flocks and herds, and in this free and independent life with its opportunities for labor, and study and meditation, they learned of God and taught their children of his works and ways. What was the content? The words and works of God. Who were the teachers? It was the parents. What was the unit of organization? It was in the context of the family. Let's continue in history. Moses, that next great leader in Israel's history. God needed a leader to bring his people out of Egypt. And to prepare a leader to accomplish this, what system of education did he choose? Who was Moses' teacher? For the 12, first 12 years, it was his own mother. How do you think she conducted Moses' education? Do you think she tried her best to prepare him for the crisis that was going to come when he was taken out of the home? Absolutely. We read in Patriarchs and Prophets 243 that it was with deep gratitude that Jochebed entered upon her now safe and happy task. She faithfully improved her opportunity to educate her child for God. She knew that he must soon be given up to his royal mother to be surrounded with influences that would tend to lead him away from God. All this rendered her more diligent and careful in his instruction. Mothers, if you knew you only had a few years, and then your son would be taken from the security of the home and surrounded by bad influences, would you try to make every moment count? Would you focus? intensely upon the preparation of your child for the crisis he was soon going to face. Moses' mother absolutely did that. We read, she kept the boy as long as she could, but was obliged to give him up when he was about 12 years old. The lessons learned at his mother's side could not be forgotten. They were a shield from the pride, the infidelity, and the vice that flourished amid the splendor of the court. Who was the teacher? Parents. What was the environment? The family. What was the content? Word and works of God. And what were the results? Spiritual strength seen in but few men in history. Moving forward a little bit, we find the time of Samuel. Who was Samuel's teacher? His mother, yet again. Did she have 12 years like Moses' mother? No, she had only three. We read again, Patriarchs and Prophets, during the first three years of the life of Samuel the prophet, his mother carefully taught him to distinguish between good and evil. By every familiar object surrounding him, she sought to lead his thoughts up to the Creator. His early training led him to choose to maintain his Christian integrity. What a reward was Hannah's, and what an encouragement to faithfulness is her example. Who was the teacher again? Mother. What was the environment? It was in the family. What was the content? It was the word and the works of God. And what were the results? Yet again, 
spiritual strength. What about David? <laughs> we find the same story. In fact, over and over this story was repeated in the history of Israel. Why? Because these faithful families were following the instruction that God had given in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 6 through 7, which reads these words, which I command thee this day. Whose words? God's words. Shall be in thine heart. Who's this speaking to? The parents, right? Where does true education need to begin? Not with the young people, but with the parents. There must be a change of heart in the parents. The words of God must be implanted in the heart of the parents. What does it mean for something to be in your heart? It changes you, right? It becomes who you are. God says you need to be changed. You need to be transformed by my word and become the example of who I am to your children. And while there are many ideas of education out there that simply say you just need to be the right example and that's all you can do, God doesn't stop there with that instruction, right? Is the example important? Absolutely vital. But does he stop with the example? No, he continues. Deuteronomy chapter 6, thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Be the example, be transformed by the power of God's word. But then thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. How? A class once a week? No. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. This was the plan of education given to the nation of Israel by God himself. Parents, be transformed by my word and then spend time with your children. Teach them all the time, sitting, walking, lying down, rising up, invest in relationship. And the words that are in your heart will come spilling out as you spend time together. That's true education. We see it was successful in the days of the patriarchs, in the days of Moses, in the days of Samuel, or I should say in the upbringing, the education of Moses, the upbringing of Samuel. But now we come to the heart of our study this morning, Daniel, a man who exhibited a spiritual strength seen in but few in history, a man who stood for his faith at any cost, a man who represents those who will stand for their faith in the last days. What was his training? What prepared him? Where is Daniel chapter zero? <laughs> Let's go there. Before we turn to the scriptures, I want to read a beautiful description of the education given to the children of Israel in the book Fundamentals of Christian Education, education page 95. We read, God commanded the Hebrews to teach their children his requirements and to make them acquainted with all his dealings with their people. The home and the school were one. In the place of stranger lips, the loving hearts of father and mother were to give instruction to their children. This was the command given to the children of Israel. This was not optional. What was the unit of organization? It was in the family. Who were the teachers? It was the parents. Now, what was the content? Let's keep reading. Thoughts of God were associated with all the events of daily life in the home dwelling. The mighty works of God and the deliverance of his people were recounted with eloquence and reverential awe. The great truths of God's providence and of the future life were impressed upon the young mind. It became acquainted with the true, the good, and the beautiful. What was the content of this plan of education? Truth, nature, sacred history. Again, it was a true education based in the word of God. When did they do this? How did they do this? Continuing, by the use of figures and symbols, like the sanctuary services, right? The lessons given were illustrated and thus more firmly fixed in the memory. Through this animated imagery, the child was almost from infancy initiated, when did this begin? Infancy. Initiated into the mysteries, the wisdom, and the hopes of his fathers and guided in a way of thinking and feeling and anticipating that reached beyond things seen and transitory to the unseen and eternal. What a beautiful plan of education. But we're not done. Let's keep reading. From this education, what were the results? From this education, many a youth of Israel came forth vigorous in body and mind, quick to perceive and strong to act, the heart prepared like good ground for the growth of the precious seed, the mind trained to see God in the words of revelation and the scenes of nature, the stars of heaven, the trees and flowers of the field, the lofty mountains, the babbling brooks all spoke to him, and the voices of the prophets heard throughout the land met a response in his heart. What a beautiful plan of education. We're going to analyze it in that in a moment, but I want to continue reading because you're saying, what does this have to do with Daniel? How do I know this was Daniel's education? Yes, it was the command given to the children of Israel, but did Daniel's parents follow it? Continuing, 
such was the training. In other words, everything we've just read, such was the training of Moses in the lowly cabin home in Goshen, of Samuel by the faithful Hannah, of David in the hill dwelling of Bethlehem, and of, of Daniel, of Daniel, before the scenes of captivity separated him from the home of his fathers. What was Daniel's education like? It was everything we just read about. Focused in the family, focused in truth. Such was the training of Daniel. Now, I want to go back to this for a minute, though, because I want to analyze. There are three important components of this plan of education. And I want to unpack this because this is very practical for us today. We read that the mind was trained to see God in the words of revelation, first of all. What are the words of revelation? Give me a modern term for that today. Well, that would be the Bible, right? The revealed words of God to us, the words of revelation. Secondly, the scenes of nature. And thirdly, the voices of the prophets. What would we call that today? Of course, it's the spirit of prophecy. So what was the content of this model of education that was given by God to Israel and that Daniel's parents themselves followed? The Word of God, nature, and the spirit of prophecy. The Word of God, nature, and the spirit of prophecy. The environment we find was the home. The teachers were the father and mother. The instructional material was the Word of God, nature, and the spirit of prophecy. And the results, every time God's plan was followed, were spiritual strength. Question. Do we have the Word of God available to us today? Amen. Do we have even more than Daniel's parents had? Do we have nature available to us today? We should seek to place ourselves in these surroundings. Do we have the spirit of prophecy? (laughs) Friends, we have more. We have more of this precious content of true education than Daniel's parents had. Just as the crisis we are about to face is greater than the crisis that Daniel faced, we have even more to prepare us. Now, is there, a, is there a method to follow? Absolutely. We read about that in Deuteronomy. Parents transformed by this word, following these three areas, word of God, nature, and spirit of prophecy in their own lives, and then spending time with the children, investing in relationship, teaching them diligently. The content and the method are both vitally important. Now, to more fully understand Daniel's story, let's go to the Bible. And let's go 100 years previous to the life of Daniel. 100, more or less, 100 years previous to Daniel. And we find in 2 Kings. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 20. 2 Kings and chapter 20. We find the story here of Hezekiah on his deathbed. And it's a fascinating story. Hezekiah was on his deathbed. He he was about to die and he didn't want to and he prayed for healing and the Lord assured him of his healing. The Lord healed him and also offered this sign of his healing, the sign of that he would heal Hezekiah. Now, what was the sign? Does anyone remember? The sun went backwards, right? Now, this caught the attention of many nations. I'm sure this probably went on, you know, maybe the global news channels, right? Hezekiah the king, saved from his illness. Sun goes back. It caught everyone's attention, and it especially caught the attention of the Babylonians. Why? Because, well, they were ardent students of astronomy. In fact, they worshipped the sun. So it really caught their attention when the sun moved. And they said, we need to go find out about Hezekiah's God. So they made a journey to Jerusalem. Hezekiah, congratulations. We heard you were healed from your sickness. We're happy about that. But Hezekiah, what we'd really like to know is more about your God because evidently your God is more powerful than our God because your God just moved our God. What did Hezekiah do? Let me show you all my treasures. 
That just wasn't very intelligent, was it? I mean, from a logical intelligence standpoint, that was not very smart. But it was also not glorifying to God because Hezekiah missed a precious opportunity to point those Babylonian visitors to the power of the God of heaven. And as those Babylonian visitors were walking out of the palace, in came Isaiah the prophet. And we find in 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 16 through 18, Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the, saith the Lord. All those things you just showed all your enemies, all those Babylonian visitors, they're, <laughs> they're going to come and take it. And that was bad enough, but it didn't stop there. Verse 18, and of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, they shall take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, they shall take away. Imagine you were a mother with sons at this period in Israel's history. What would you do? You've heard the mistake of your king. You've heard the prophecy. You know that your family will be torn apart and your children carried into captivity. You know they will be called to stand before kings, that they will have to answer for their faith in courts of justice, perhaps separately and alone. And I quote there from the spirit of prophecy as to our own destiny, to answer for our faith in the courts of justice, perhaps separately and alone. You've heard this prophecy as a mother in Israel. What are you going to do? This choice was presented to every Hebrew mother. I'd like to read something from one of the early pioneers, Stephen Haskell, in his book, The Story of Daniel the Prophet. He has some really amazing parallels and um, draws some important lessons on true education from the story of Daniel. I read here from Stephen Haskell, The Story of Daniel the Prophet. Three years after his life had been saved, a son was born to Hezekiah. Notwithstanding the recent prophecy, Hezekiah and his wife Hephzibah failed to teach the young Manasseh in the way of truth. He was but 12 years of age when he came to the throne, but if he had been trained in the fear of God, he would not have chosen the worship of the heathen. At the age of 12 years, Christ made a decision which saved the world. At the same age, Manasseh chose a course which brought ruin to the nation. In the training of your child, are you Hephzibah or Mary? Hmm, what a question. And yet the Lord was merciful. That son Manasseh reigned for 55 long years. Oh, the Lord was merciful. 55 years and yet the prophecy of captivity was not yet fulfilled. This was long enough for a generation to pass, long enough for those impre initial impressions to wear off, for Laodiceanism to set in. Men began to wonder if it would ever come to pass. Since the fathers fell asleep, said they, all things continue as they were, just as people say today about Jesus coming, right? And yet captivity was predicted. Captivity was coming. And because of this neglect, that final overthrow was hastened. It's said by the historians of Israel, Jerusalem was destroyed because the education of her children was neglected. Why did the people fall into idolatry? Why did the kings turn away? Why? Because their training was neglected as children. But now we come to the heart of Daniel chapter 0. The grandson of Manasseh. The grandson of Manasseh was good King Josiah, and it was Josiah's reforms that prepared a few youth to stand in the court of the king. He began to reign at the age of eight. Imagine that. 
what a responsibility at eight years of age. But he determined from the very start he would be different. He determined to learn from the mistakes of his fathers. He set his heart to do what was right. The Bible says he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and turned neither to the right hand nor to the left. Josiah began this series of reforms. He traveled around the nation of Israel, casting down the altars, destroying the high places, and bringing the people back to the worship of God, instituting the Passover, bringing back the feast. He did everything in his power to help the people turn back to the worship of God. And one of the things they were doing in their reforms was restoring the temple. And as he was conducting these reforms, as he was restoring the temple, they found something in the temple. What did they find? Who knows what they found? The book of the law. And thus began an educational reform, the book of the law. The first step in this process of educational reform that Josiah conducted was a return to the word of God, study of the book of the law. Now, what was this book of the law? As in the Hebrew uh, terminology, the book of the law, a large part of that would have been the book of Deuteronomy. And there as the scribe Shaphan read, the king heard the blessings and the curses. He heard set forth the need for an education based in the word of God. He heard their failure to obey. He heard that his nation's prosperity, no, its survival depended upon their obedience to God's word, to that law. And he understood they were a disobedient people. His response, he rent his clothes. Prophets and Kings 396. As the king read the prophecies of swift judgment upon those who should persist in rebellion, he trembled for the future. The perversity of Judah had been great. What was to be the outcome of their continued apostasy? Friends, that book of Deuteronomy was a book that was the covenant of the education that Israel was supposed to give to their children. And Josiah saw their failures to follow God's plan of education. He saw that those failures to follow God's plan of education was hastening the final overthrow. He understood the prophecies that had been given predicting captivity. And he said, (laughs) he said, we're in a bad way. What can we do? Friends, do we tremble for the future? Do we understand our need for an education in the Word of God like Josiah did? Did Do we understand that our prosperity, our survival depends on adherence to the Word of God? Do we consider our departures from the Word of God and do we tremble as did Josiah? What will be our response, friends? I pray that we will not rend our garments, but we will rend our hearts. But Josiah took another step that's absolutely vital. We saw true education involve the Word of God, and so the first step was a return to the Word of God in that book of the law. But we saw also that that true education involved the spirit of prophecy, and that was the next thing Josiah did. He turned to the spirit of prophecy. He said, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me. And they went to hold uh, the prophetess. What was the question that Josiah brought to hold of the prophetess? It was, you've seen the reforms. You've seen the efforts that we've made to turn the people back to the worship of God. You've seen how we've destroyed the altars and the high places. You've seen how we're bringing back the Passover. I've done everything in my power to bring the people back to the worship of God. Now question, is there anything we can do to avert the doom that is coming upon our nation? Can we avoid captivity? If we stay faithful to God, can we avoid destruction as a nation? What was the response? It was too late. It was too late. Because of the sins of his fathers, destruction would come nevertheless. But here's the most important part. What did Josiah do when he heard that it was too late? Did the king give up when he heard he could not avert the doom? and the destruction. No, Josiah's response, very different than Hezekiah's a hundred years previous when the destruction was 
was predicted and Hezekiah said, well, as long as it's not happening in my days. That was the message given to Josiah. It won't happen during your reign. Josiah could have easily said, well, it won't happen during my time. So nice try, but oh, well, no, 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 no. Josiah said, if destruction is coming, if my people will be taken captive, if the youth of our nation are going to face a crisis and answer for their faith in the court of kings, then I will make every moment count to prepare them for what is coming upon our nation. Josiah worked even harder when he heard it was too late to avert the destruction. And Josiah began a program, a third step in educational reform. First was return to the word of God. Second, a return to the spirit of prophecy. And three, an education of the family. Go with me to 2 Kings chapter 23. We're coming to the end of Daniel chapter 0. 2 Kings chapter 23 and verse 1 and 2. 2 Kings 23, 1 and 2. And the king sent, and they gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen to how many times the Bible says all. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah, and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him, and the priests, and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. What did the king do? He gathered all the people, the Bible says, small and great, everyone. Now, what was the date of the reading of the law? It's an interesting study. You can follow the chronology, do a little history study. I'll summarize it, that the date of the reading of the law was two years before Daniel's birth. This time when the king brought all the people together to listen to the reading of the law, when he brought all the people together to listen to the book of Deuteronomy, a book detailing the education that their children should have, it was two years before Daniel's birth, and the Bible says all the people came to listen to the reading of the law. Therefore. Who was in the audience? Daniel's parents. Daniel's parents were there listening to the reading of the law. What did they hear? What did they hear as they listened to this reading of the law? They would have heard in Deuteronomy chapter 4 that obedience to God's word was a condition of them being a light to the nations. Chapter 4, chapter 6, chapter 8, that obedience to God's word was a condition of entering the promised land. Chapter 4, chapter 5, that obedience to God's word was a condition of prosperity. Chapter 7, that obedience to God's word was a condition of God fulfilling his covenant, of a, a condition of them being that, in that position of leadership. They would have heard that the word of God was to be esteemed as important as their physical food. It was a condition of being the greatest nation. They would have heard the blessings versus the curses. They would have heard that captivity was predicted if they were not faithful to the word of God. And they would have also heard that if they returned to God, they could return from captivity. In other words, in this message, in this reading of the book of Deuteronomy, they understood, they would have heard that they needed to focus on a return to the word of God, but there, that's not all. They would have also heard, repeated many times throughout the book, it's a verse we quote many times, but it is repeated often throughout the book of Deuteronomy, that these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. These words which you're hearing, shall be in your heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. This is what Daniel's parents heard. And then, as they were awakened to their responsibility, their attention was turned to the spirit of prophecy. They were reminded of the prophecies of Isaiah and many others, pointing them to the Babylonian captivity. They were told that inquiry had been made to the prophetess Holda as to whether the destruction could be avoided. And they were told, probably by the king himself, with tears running down his face, Oh, my people, destruction is still coming. Because of the sins of our fathers, doom is certain. So it is up to you, my people, prepare our young people for what is coming. Follow God's plan of education. Base your children's education in the word of God and prepare them for the crisis.
And what did they do? Well, four mothers, at least, chose to obey. The mother of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Or maybe it was one mother. Maybe they were brothers. We don't know. But nonetheless, they chose to instruct their sons in the ways of true education. They obeyed the command given in Deuteronomy. Will we recognize the times in which we are living, my friends? Will we understand that our young people, are the, this, this new generation coming upon the stage of action, may very well be Earth's final generation and have to answer for their faith in the courts of justice, separately and alone? I want to read again from Stephen Haskell. He says, Daniel had a godly mother who knew of the prophecy concerning the destruction of their city. She repeated to her son the words of God that someday Hebrew children must stand in the heathen court in Babylon. Carefully did this mother teach her son to read the parchment scrolls of the prophets. This education was not gained in the schools of the time. That's an important uh, point, friends. We're not going to gain this education in the schools of our day. For they had departed from the plan of God. But holy mothers, living close to the everlasting Father, led their children by precept and example, by word and song, to form characters that would stand the test. Ah, oh, my friends, are we following the example of Daniel's mother and father? But alas, the capital was entered. Treasures from the house of God were ruthlessly torn from their place and dedicated to heathen worship. Bright, promising youth, including Daniel himself, were taken from the royal family to serve in the king of Babylon. And what were the results? We come now to the, to the end of Daniel chapter 0. We've seen how they were educated. We've seen how they were prepared for the crisis with that education based in the word of God, nature, and the spirit of prophecy in the environment of the home with the father and mother teaching, first of all, putting God's words in their own hearts, being transformed by his word, and then spending time with the children, teaching them diligently. This was how Daniel's uh, parents prepared them for the test. But in the remaining time that we have, let's focus a little bit on the success story because it's encouraging. It's interesting to note that Daniel and his friends were pronounced well-educated upon arrival in Babylon. Again, I read from Story of Daniel the Prophet by Stephen Haskell. Now, he says, can be seen the results of the home training. You might not have seen it before, right? You may not have noticed as the, in that quiet instruction of the home, people may have criticized Daniel's parents. Oh, you know, you're not really, you're not preparing them for for, for, for real life, or all the things that people often say, right, about an education based in God's word. No, they were preparing them for the crisis. But now, when the crisis came, can be seen the results of home training. You, you didn't see it before the crisis, but when the crisis comes, now you see the results. Pure food, clean thoughts, and physical exercise placed them on the list of children in whom was no blemish but well favored. But what of their intellectual ability? They had not been educated in the schools of Jerusalem, much less in those of Babylon. Was there not great danger that they lacked in the sciences or the essential branches? On examination, these four passed as skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and able to learn a difficult foreign language. God had fulfilled his promise to these children of the home school. How beautiful. Or as the book Education simply puts it, Daniel and his companions had been faithfully instructed in the principles of the Word of God. Friends, I just want to put it this way. How were Daniel and his friends prepared? Was it an accident? Did they wait till they got to Babylon? Oh, I hope we're prepared. Did Daniel's parents just pray? Oh, I hope they'll be prepared when the crisis comes. No, they made every minute count to do everything in their power to prepare them for the crisis. Was it still God's power that enabled them to be successful? Absolutely. It was not human power, but God worked through the efforts of Daniel's parents. Daniel's success was a result of true education. Again, Haskell says, where are the parents who today are teaching their children to control appetite and to look to God as the source of all wisdom. Were these principles practiced, more young persons could be trusted as missionaries in responsible positions and in institutions of learning. Many will yet be called to stand before judges and kings. How are the children being educated? Oh, my friends, the lessons here are great. They are pertinent to the last days. Now, in spiritual Israel, what method of education will you choose to prepare your children for the crisis? 
But before we finish, consider something with me. Babylon was a powerful nation, yes. But it was not power alone that Babylon was known for. Babylon was also the educational center of the world. Every art and science was taught in the schools of Babylon. They reveled in the study of astronomy and higher mathematics. There were linguists who could teach every nation on earth. The king himself was highly educated and granted the degrees. And into this proud educational center, this Stanford, Yale, and Harvard all rolled up together, into this proud educational center were thrust four young men, slaves from a despised race, products of home education based in the Word of God. How could they compete? Surely they were not prepared. Oh, but hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world, according to 1 Corinthians 1.20. In the Babylonian court, this was exemplified. Here we have Nebuchadnezzar. All his counselors, when he had that dream, who did he call for help first? The astrologers, the wise men, the magicians, right? What would we call this today? Well, <laughs> they were the teachers in the Babylonian university. These were the professors, the doctors. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar called before him the most brilliant and well-educated men of the nation to help him interpret that dream. Couldn't do it. So along comes Daniel. He doesn't have much education, just three years of Babylonian training. But he's had true education before he ever came to Babylon. And what that meant is he was connected with the source of wisdom. So here stands Daniel interpreting a dream that his teachers could not interpret. How was this possible? Was it because he was extra smart? Because he had studied harder than all the rest of them? No, because he was connected with the source of wisdom. This is true education. When we are faithful to connect our children with the source of wisdom, we need not fear. They may be torn from us. They may be surrounded with influences we cannot control. But they can be trusted. God can trust them because they are connected with him. This is true education connecting our children with the source of wisdom. Psalm 119, 99 and 100. I have more understanding than all my teachers. Why? <laughs> For thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. And a few years later with that story on the plain of Dura, with the golden image, symbolic of that last test on the matter of worship that is to come to this world, it was again those who had received true education, who were connected with the source of wisdom and dependent upon the Lord, who were spiritually successful. Haskell again asked the question, who will be able to stand? Who will be able to stand when this decree to worship the image of the beast is enforced? Who will choose ra rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season? What children are now being trained and educated in these principles of integrity to God? From what homes will come the Daniels and the Meshachs? This will be the final test brought upon the servants of God. All my friends, how will it be for us today? Will we be faithful to God's plan of education? Again, how were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah prepared? These representatives of the final generation upon this earth, God's last days people subjected to the same tests that may be brought upon our youth, how were they prepared? Did they prepare when they arrived in Babylon? No, they prepared much earlier than that. Their parents worked to prepare them. They were prepared in the home as children long before they arrived in Babylon. How? In the family, the parents as the teachers, using the Word of God, nature, and the spirit of prophecy. It's the same for us today, friends. We're told in the book Education, page 276, never 
Will education accomplish all that it might and should accomplish until, let's pause there, never, it says. How often is never? <laughs> it's just never, right? <laughs> it won't happen. Education will not accomplish all that it might accomplish. Education will not accomplish all that it should accomplish until, until what? Two things. First of all, the importance of the parents' work is fully recognized and they receive a training for its sacred responsibilities. Fully recognize their work and receive a training for its sacred responsibilities. Until this happens, education will not accomplish what God designs it to accomplish and what it can accomplish by His power. Parents, are you recognizing your work? I don't mean casual assent. Are you fully recognizing your work? Now, for those who may be wondering, I'm not leaving schools out of this. Schools are important. Schools have a place in God's plan when they follow true education. The true teacher can very much enter into this work of a parent, but the school is only there, according to God's design, it is only there to help the family and to help the parents, not to replace them. And for this, I am focusing on the work of the parents. All these things we've talked about, though, if you're a teacher in the school, take them and apply them in your situation, too. Parents, are you fully recognizing your work? Not just casual assent. Oh, yeah, that's my job. No, no, no. Fully recognizing the solemnity of your work. Are you receiving a training for this sacred responsibility? You say, what kind of training is that? <laughs> it's the same training given to God's people in Deuteronomy. It's the same training given to the parents of Daniel. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And I would add to that the counsel, the precious counsel we have in the spirit of prophecy fits in that same category as these words which I command thee this day shall be in your heart. Parents, study the spirit of prophecy. Study this precious message we have on true education and, do, uh, and study the Bible, of course, too. Do everything in your power to be changed by the Word of God and to impart these things to your children through the time you, spending, you are spending together. God is waiting for a generation to stand firm. Are you doing your part to raise this final generation? Do you read and study the Word of God? Are you awakened to the responsibility God has placed upon you? Are you as a family studying the Word of God in the spirit of prophecy? I ask you, will you be faithful? Will you prepare your children for the task that is soon to come upon the world? Are you earnestly and faithfully making every moment count to prepare your children to stand alone as did Daniel? Will you follow true education? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you so much for this precious counsel, for this beautiful story of the preparation of Daniel and his friends. Oh, Father, help us to obey. Help us. I lift up each family, each parent, each teacher, anyone who has care of the precious young people you've given to us. Lord, help them to make every moment count in preparing them for the test, basing their education upon your word and the counsel that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity. We ask all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.